Hey everyone, in this video we're going to derive Kepler's first law. Now Kepler was an astronomer from quite a while ago and he came up with three laws of planetary motion. So three laws describing the motion of planets around their host star. And what's really cool about these three laws is Kepler came up with them empirically. He didn't derive them using a bunch of equations and working them out. He just looked for patterns in the data and was able to find these relationships between the positions of planets in the sky and the time we look at them. So what is Kepler's first law? Kepler's first law says planets orbit their host star. So we'll be dealing with the sun and the earth um, throughout this video. Um, not in circular orbits, but rather in elliptical orbits. So an ellipse is just a squashed circle. And a circle's special point is its center. An ellipse has two special points and they're called foci or focus singular. So one of the foci will be here and the other of the foci will be here. And what Kepler's first law says is the sun is always gonna be at one of these foci and it, it can't really switch. So how are we gonna derive this law? Well, what we're trying to show here is that under the force of gravity, so Newton's law for gravity says F is equal to big G, which is a constant, a gravitational constant. We'll let big M be the mass of our sun, and we'll let little m be the mass of the Earth. So let's see the Earth's over here in its orbit. It's moving around that way. Um, so what we're trying to show is that this gravitational law will, will lead to a non-circular orbit. And this gives us two very different kinds of um, dynamics in, in terms of planetary motion. So let's say this is this, this is a circular orbit, and let's say this is an elliptical orbit. Um, for a planet in a circular orbit, our gravitational force, we'll call it Fg. Our gravitational force acts straight inwards and it's purely centripetal or purely center seeking. Whereas in an elliptical orbit, the sun isn't um, acting along, say, the radius of the ellipse, per se. Instead, there will be a bit of a skew to the force, so the force might be going this way, where it does have this centripetal component, but it also has this extra component. And because Newton's second law says forces are proportional to acceleration, this centripetal or center-seeking acceleration we know from circular motion is v squared over r, or we can also call that omega squared r, where v is the speed uh, our planet's moving at in its orbit, and omega is the same thing but angular speed. And we know the relationship that linear speed is equal to angular speed times the radius of our orbit. Because we're dealing with radii, it would probably be better to work in a polar coordinate system rather than a Cartesian one. And in, if we take the sun as our pole or center, we can see this is r away, and we can see it acting at an angle theta. Cool, so r varies with time, so does theta, and we know that omega is gonna be the rate of change of theta, so. So um, polar coordinates is a natural choice to solve this problem in. Because we're trying to end up showing that r traces out, um, our planet traces out an ellipse, it's probably worth noting that the equation of an ellipse in polar coordinates looks a bit like this. We could say r, our distance from the sun, is proportional to one over one plus some number e times cosine of theta in the denominator. And e is a scalar that is in the range zero to one which basically, it's called the eccentricity of our ellipse, and it basically tells us how squashed the ellipse is. So if E is zero, our ellipse would be a perfect circle. If E is like 0.5, there'd be a bit more of a squash to it. And if E is 0.9, it would be like super squashed. I'm not gonna derive this formula, I'll save that for another video, but just know that if you spot this kind of relationship, we're dealing with an ellipse in polar coordinates. So how are we gonna solve this using physics? Well, Kepler didn't have access to Newton's laws, but we do. Um, and Newton's second law in particular says famously F equals MA. So the net force on our planet is equal to its mass times its acceleration. The net force, well, the only force acting on our planet is a gravitational force, Fg. So Fg we know is G 
big M, massive sun, little m, massive d earth, divided by r squared. And because this is a center seeking force, um, an attractive force, by convention, we'll, uh, we give it a negative sign. And on the other side, well, we have the mass of the earth times the acceleration. Now, as we discussed before, the acceleration of the earth as it moves along is composed of two bits. The first is a center seeking component, which is an acceleration omega squared r. And the second component would be acting this way. Um, because we don't quite know what it is yet, we'll just call it the second derivative of r with respect to time. Because that's what acceleration is. And because this term over here is center seeking, just like this over here, we will put a negative sign in front of it. Now there are a couple relationships or mathematical tools we'd want to use to simplify uh, this problem. Because the most annoying thing here is we have this omega over here, which isn't constant during the orbit. Um, Kepler's second law describes it in much more detail. But the annoying thing about omega is the planet's angular speed doesn't stay constant. What does stay constant, however, is the angular momentum of the planet. And we know how to express angular momentum in terms of angular velocity. In particular, L is equal to m omega r squared, or in terms of derivatives, L is equal to m. Omega is just the time derivative of angular position times r squared. Uh, rearranging this, we can see that omega, omega is 4 dt over dt is L divided by m times r squared. And the second tool we're going to use is a substitution to make our differential equation here easy to solve. Um, this is a differential equation, by the way, because, because we're relating the derivative of r to some quantities involving r, so it's a differential equation. So the substitution we're going to use is not quite apparent why, but we're going to stick with r equals 1 over u. And this is going to make a whole bunch of sense later when we see a bunch of 1 over r's appearing, and we can just swap them out with u's. Um, and the thing worth noting here is the r dt is just, well, the derivative of u is just minus 1 over u squared um, using the power rule times the u dt. Uh, and we sort of want to inc incorporate our angular knowledge in here. So we can rewrite this time derivative as minus 1 over u squared du d theta times d theta dt. Uh, and this is just a consequence of the um, chain rule because these d theta's can cancel out. Cool. So this will now be equal to, uh, we can plug in our expression for d theta or the angular velocity. This is going to be equal to 1 u du d theta times L over m r squared which is just equal to, well, one over r squared is just u squared. So this bit and this bit are gonna cancel each other out. And this is just gonna equal minus L over m du d theta. So we've got an expression for the first derivative of position with respect to time. What about the second derivative? So the second derivative, that would just be applying the time derivative to the expression we just got in particular, minus L over M du e theta. And because the angular momentum of our system is constant and M is a constant as well, we can pull those constants out and we'll see we have ddt, but we're gonna rewrite ddt as d d theta times d theta dt. And we still have that du d, d theta. Uh, and now moving around our differential operators, we can see minus L over M, times d theta dt is times, well, now we've got two um, differentiations with respect to theta. So we're just differentiating u with respect to theta twice. So it's not a second derivative. And we can further incorporate our angular knowledge because we know what d theta dt is. It's just uh, L over m. Uh, and it, it's supposed to be one over r squared, but we can just say u squared instead have the second derivative here and this actually makes it in a really nice form because it's just l u of m squared d2 u d theta squared 
Awesome. So now we know. Now do we know what the second derivative of position is with respect to time? We can plug all of this into our original differential equation. So notice on the left hand side we had negative g big M little m. Instead of dividing by r squared, we'll just times by u squared. And we know that is going to equal little m times our first acceleration term was omega squared times r. That's just the theta dt squared divided by u. Uh, and that was negative because it was center seeking, just like the gravitational force. And the second term was this over here. Something we can do is we can remove these little m's from both sides, just changing our force vector equation into an acceleration vector equation. And what we want to do now is rewrite this derivative and this derivative in terms of u's. So what would that look like? We would have negative g m u squared is equal to, we know that d theta dt is just equal to L divided by M R squared or L over M U squared. So we're gonna have that squared. And we're gonna multiply that by one over U. And we're gonna add um, D to R DT squared, which is just minus L over M U squared times D to U D theta squared. Uh, multiplying all of this out, we get negative g m u squared is equal to minus l over m u to the power of 4 divided by u, so u cubed minus l u over m squared d squared u d theta squared. And we can actually multiply this throughout by negative 1 to turn all of these minuses into pluses. And this is supposed to be an l squared over m squared. Um, we can now we can now multiply both sides by m squared over l squared, which is just dividing by this fraction we have over here. Um, and let's also get rid of the u, um, u squareds as well. So we'll multiply by that as well. And what we'll get is g big M little m squared over the angular momentum squared is equal to so we'll just be left with u over here and over here we will just be left with d2u d theta square right so that was a lot of manipulation but what we've got here is a second order uh, non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation which is really easy to solve so let's first consider solving the homogeneous case to get a complementary function. So the homogeneous case um, would come with, the homogeneous case would look like this. Second derivative of u plus u equals zero. Uh, its auxiliary equation would be lambda squared plus one equals zero. So lambda is gonna equal plus or minus square root of minus one i. So our complementary function would be u equaling big A, some constant, times cos of 1 times theta, so cos theta, plus B times sine of theta. And what we can do here is we can actually use the R formula to rewrite this in terms of just a cos. In particular, we can say this is going to equal R times the cos of theta plus some extra angle we'll call alpha, where r is going to equal the square root of a squared plus b squared, and alpha is going to equal the negative tan of b over a. And if you're not familiar with the r formula, I'll make a video on it later. It's a bunch of trick, a trick Terry goes into this. But what we're trying to achieve at here is we're trying to get the solution in the form of a cosine because we know our equation ellipse has a cosine in it. Great, so this is our solution, this is our complementary function, the solution to the homogeneous equation. Now what about the full equation? Well, something we can spot here is if we plug in 
u equals this constant over here, um, we'll know the second derivative of that constant is zero. So that's actually a, a particular solution to our equation. So in our particular solution, we can let u equal g big M little m squared over l squared. And that, will, and that tells us that the second derivative of this expression with respect to theta, well, because it's constant, its first derivative is zero, and consequently, its second derivative is also zero. So plugging that in, we'll see that g big M little m squared over L squared is equal to u, which is just that exact same fraction, plus the second derivative of u with respect to theta, which is zero. So this is actually a particular solution. Um, and from the theory of ordinary differential equations, we can say that our general solution is just u, uh, which is equal to our complementary function, r cos theta plus alpha, plus our particular solution, g m m squared over l squared. And rewriting this in terms of r, you can see that 1 over r is going to equal r cos theta plus alpha plus g m m squared over l squared. And by deciding where our um, zero angle is in our um, elliptical orbit, so remember how I said we have this in a polar coordinate system, we have an initial pole, and we measure all angles with respect to that. Uh, and we can choose our pole to be pointing in any direction. So we could have our pole this way, but we could also have our pole, say, this way. And then in that case, all of our angles will be offset by some amount, um, delta, for example. Uh, so we can choose which way we orient our pole, and we can orient our pole in such a way that um, this alpha offset is always zero. So in that case, we can say r is equal to one over big R, cos of theta plus this constant. And what we have there is something similar of the form r being proportional to some eccentricity times cosine theta plus the number one. We can just factor out variables to make it look like this form. And that is an ellipse. And there we've shown it. So the assumptions we were building on were, if you have a planet moving in an orbit that we know is not circular, so an orbit where we know the uh, gravitational force is not pointing towards the center of our orbit shape, it's a bit sk askew. And that force is an inverse square force, which is crucial for this substitution over here to work. Then the orbit must be an ellipse, because that's the only possible solution to this differential equation over here which we solved by rewriting instead of RT space, we're gonna re rewrote it in um, U theta space because it looked much simpler with that substitution. That's Kepler's first law. It was, it's really cool that Kepler was able to come up with this just by looking at the data uh, because he didn't have access to all this heavy machinery of Newton's second law.